to me. Do you want to step this way a little bit away from the speaker? Um, so she is with Stepping Stones Network, which is, I mean, she'll tell you more about them, but I first heard about them maybe four years ago as they were first stepping into Lake County to help fight human trafficking. They're a Christian organization, so I think, right, for all of us, it's just so encouraging when you can hear about other Christians that are doing this work and what they're doing in our community, not just far away, in other countries or other counties or states, but really, like, how are they serving the people here and how can we partner with them? So she's going to do her presentation and then she's the director of education there. So I think it's going to be really good. She's going to leave some time for questions afterwards. So we'll have the microphone. So as she's going, if you think of stuff, um, just, yeah, we'll give you some time for that at the end as well. So thank you, Jean. And thank you. I can maybe adjust the voice as I talk. I am so, so glad to be here. I love it when... I love it when, uh, Just keep going. sure, <laughs> I love it when Christians seek knowledge, you know, first of all, knowledge about God's word, and then knowledge about God's world, and how to apply that word to the world, and the good news about trafficking is that we Christians can do something about it, I'm from Stepping Stones, fighting trafficking in Lake County, and we have a home for trafficked moms uh, and their children in Lake County, we're going to talk about sex trafficking, what it is, where it is, what are its root causes, how you can recognize somebody who's trafficked, and how we can help. Sex trafficking is exchanging a sex act for something of value through force, fraud, or coercion. Force, fraud, or coercion have to be there in order for it to be trafficking. Force can be being beaten, being tortured, being uh, confined, having her, her money and uh, identification taken away from her, or she could be coerced, not necessarily being beaten, but maybe having to watch somebody else get beaten. Being threatened, being threatened, threatening her family, threatened with blackmail, saying she can't leave until she pays her debt. But by far the biggest lure into trafficking is fraud, the promise of a job, promise of safety, promise of housing, promise of love, somebody to care for her. Now, force, fraud, or coercion do not have to be there if it's a child. Anyone under 18 in the eyes of the law are looked at as not volunteering to be a prostitute, but they were forced into it. And that's the Traffic Victim Protection Act that takes the word prostitute and really turns it into victim. In fact, wise and knowledgeable policemen understand that about all prostitutes, that their idea, their goal is not to arrest a prostitute, but to reach out to her and offer her safety and help if she'll take it. Now just because children can't be arrested for prostitution doesn't mean they aren't very valuable on the sex trafficking market. This little girl is part of a massive sex trafficking ring a child sex trafficking ring uh, that was rescued three years ago. She's, what, maybe five there? Three years later, what do you think she would be doing now if she were not rescued? She could be dead because the lifespan for a trafficked person is about seven years. Otherwise, she would be an eight-year-old prostitute. And in 10 years, she would be an 18-year-old prostitute. And during those years, she would have been growing by numbers, but she wouldn't have grown intellectually or socially or spiritually. But what she would be doing is having sex 10 or 15 times a day, six or seven days a week. And the man who was selling her would be making approximately $300,000 a year, of which she would probably get nothing. Now, you notice I'm using the word she and her. You know, Trafficking happens to men and women, boys, girls, LGBT. But by far the majority are women and girls, so I usually slip into that she and her conversation. So where is all this trafficking taking place? Well, the United States is probably the biggest purveyor consumer of sex trafficking, along with Mexico and the Philippines. But you must know that all the countries deal in trafficking. 
But closer to home, in Chicagoland, 16 to 25,000 women and girls are sold for sex every year. Closer to home, here, is a map of Lake County, which has many massage parlors. Massage parlors are legitimate businesses, often doing illegitimate activity. The map on your right is one we put together about seven years ago. The red squares are stores going up and down, north and south are going down Milwaukee Avenue. East and west are on Dundee, but it's seven years old. There are massage parlors all over, Lake County and Cook County, Evanston, Skokie, Mundelein, Schaumburg, all over. And massage parlors, spas, strip clubs, and the streets, there are still streets in Lake County and Cook County, where you can drive by and pick up a date. These four, first four places are places where you go and get, just go physically and get a trafficked person or a, se a, a sex person who's usually trafficked. But trafficking is usually arranged for online. So escort services and any other trafficker who's putting his girl online and advertising for services has to have a place where that date can be consummated. And that's usually in a hotel, a motel, apartment, any place along the way. And I wrote down I-94 corridor because you and I live on the I-94 corridor that runs between Milwaukee, which is a hotbed of trafficking called the uh, Harvard for Pimps, that runs through Lake County into Chicagoland, Chicago, O'Hare, another hotbed of trafficking. And on the way, we go through Lake County where traffickers can make dates at hotels and motels and restaurants and truck stops for their women or men. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that you have to move a person, you have to traffic a person for her to be trafficked. You can keep her in a back bedroom for 30 years and sell her, and that's called trafficking. And then the final one is gangs. Gangs are a huge problem, getting huger all the time in trafficking because you can sell a gun once, you can sell drugs once, but you can sell a girl over and over and over again. I don't ha there are about 75 gangs in Lake County, and uh, I don't have the numbers for their sexual activity, but I know that Portland, Oregon, uh, has 50% of its child sex trafficking is done by gangs. San Diego has 90% of its gang trafficking done by gangs. So these are the people they target to bring into the sex trafficking market. Previously sexually abused, socially isolated, unsupervised youth, homeless, LGBT. I can't even see that one. <laughs> oh, that one. Yeah, that's a good, big one. Um, <laughs> uh, immigrants, uh, single mothers, chemically dependent, DCFS groups, DCFS, and people who have aged out of DCFS and foster care. And this last one is very powerful. Anyone, anyone with a cell phone or a computer is vulnerable to be trafficked. So that's the target. Those are some of the targets for the traffickers. But underlying it, there are three underlying root causes for trafficking. And the first one is objectification treating someone as a mere object, someone to be used and abused. You know, we women have always been objectified way back in the pinup days, and now it's uh, movies and songs and video games and ads. The ad on the left is selling insurance, as if dropping her shorts was a benefit of buying insurance. But the problem with objectifying women is that our, our little sisters and our daughters copy that provocative costuming. And they are becoming provocative lures for traffickers. The pictures on the right is not a spread of pornography. These are ads for Abercrombie and & Fitch and American Apparel. And the word provocative comes from provoke. Provokes the attention of pornographers, pedophiles, and traffickers. So the first root cause of trafficking is objectification. 
The second one is a huge one. It is pornography. Pornography teaches people how to perform. That little girl that was rescued, had she not been rescued, she would have been shown pornographic videos to show her what's expected, what she was supposed to do. It also teaches people who watch it that women like sexual violence. 88% of the popular pornographic videos show violence in sex toward women. It also shows, teaches the men who watch it how to get more and more deviant behavior and they leave the watching and to the doing. Pornography is everywhere. There are, this is outdated, there are not two billion websites, there are three billion. And they grew exponentially during the uh, quarantine. 90% of children are watching it. Of course they're watching it. It's on their phones. It's on their computers. Their boyfriends are showing it to them. And they're doing sexting, showing na their naked body online to somebody else. They don't understand that sexting by kids in the eyes of the law is child pornography. They could be labeled a sex offender that would keep them from going to the military or the college of their choice or a job of their choice. 64% of people are watching pornography once a week and pornography sites get more visitors than Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter combined. The graph on your right, although it's five years old, it shows a five year exponential growth in cell phone pornography. This one is stark. 57% of pastors admit they've had struggled with pornography. And we think that pornography needs to be addressed in the church. In fact, we have a pornography um, addiction group that meets periodically. And this next one for Stepping Stone starts on February 2nd. And if any of you want to get a hold of me, I'll tell you where it is. 90% uh, of crew students, um, that's a college ministry, say they've struggled with pornography. These statistics came from Josh McDowell and George Barna just a couple of years ago. I think I already said that. Oh, let me go back to that one. So pornography arouses in men, or people who watch it, Five chemical reactions. The primary one is dopamine. So when he watches pornography, the dopamine stimulates an arousal for more pornography, which arouses more dopamine, which is, stimulates more arousal. So it's an arousal addiction. It teaches the brain to prefer the images on the screen of which he can get any amount of variety he wants, any number he wants, prefer that to the partner he has. So number three, first was objectification, number two is uh, pornography, and number three is sexual abuse. Most traffic victims, most traffickers were abused as children, 80, 90%. Most of that abuse came from family, maybe some friends, but mostly family. 40% of the abusers were other children. So what happens when a little boy or a little girl is sexually abused repeatedly? They grow up confused and vulnerable, not knowing right from wrong. How, if this person is my family, what, why he's, is this right? Is this love? How am I loved? Very confused, very hurting, very hungry for clarity and love. So what happens when the girl grows up, she's vulnerable and recognizable. When a boy grows up who's been abused, he's vulnerable, but he can recognize it in her. And so what he does is often take on the role of the trafficker. He comes alongside of her and promises her safety and freedom and gifts and love. And this sounds great. Nobody has ever treated her like that before. 
And so it doesn't take much for him to lure her into a relationship with him because this is the first time anybody has ever loved her. And so they become a twosome. Until one day he says, you know, we don't have enough money to pay rent. Do you suppose you could go to a strip club, entertain a few of my men friends? And it hurts her because she thought she was away from all this. But he loves her, and it's not that she doesn't know how to do this. Somebody's been doing this to her all her life. And so she agrees. And she takes on a client. And then another one. And another one. And there are more customers and more venues and more control by her trafficker because now her boyfriend has become her trafficker. And more abuse from him as he gets more greedy and more abuse from her customers because when someone buys you for an hour, you're mine and I can do anything with you because you're my object. And so there's danger in that. And so you wonder, it's almost as bad as it was before. Why doesn't she leave? So why doesn't she? She doesn't know where to go because where she's come has been that way. She's trapped because she has no money. She has no ID. She's afraid he could beat her because he has beaten her. She runs away. She may be on drugs by now to kill some of that pain of what she's been doing. She's learned not to trust the police, and she has nowhere to go. And what else is she going to do? And with whom? He's the one that takes care of her. He he doesn't beat her all the time. There are some good times, and she has nobody to take care of her. So here's a story of somebody like that. You may have to turn the volume up. Is there a clock back there? You be my clock, Ashley. Do 30, do 40. (laughs) You know, you're 12 years old and you're living with your moms and... One more time, we can skip it if it doesn't work, because it was just a presentation of what I've told you. I'd take this off, but I'm trapped in. You know, you're 12 years old and you're living with your moms and your mom's is struggling because she didn't think that life was really going to work out like this for her and she doesn't have a man around and the men that are around haven't always been that great. Sexual abuse is becoming kind of normal for you and you think that other people don't have secrets that are as bad as you and maybe you've tried to talk to somebody at school and they haven't really heard you or maybe they just haven't had time to listen to you. 
so you're seeing these girls on, on the videos and they're so pretty and they're so sexy and, and so your way at 12 of escaping into this fantasy world is to think about what it must be like to be one of these girls and you know that adult men already look at you and you wonder how you can kind of use that. I was just a child and that's how I was supposed to live, like a child, like an adult. So one day you're coming out of school and there's a guy outside in a Cadillac and he's he's nice looking. I mean, he's he's got the baseball cap and the jeans and the Tims and he tells you how pretty you are and you know how pretty your hair looks and it's been a while since anybody even really noticed anything about you. And for the first time you feel like somebody's really interested in you because now all of a sudden he's asking you about your dreams and your hopes and where your father's at and he says that he can be a daddy to you. The people that I shouldn't have depend on, I was depending on for support, for support, for support. And so that night he takes you to a club and he puts you up on the stage and he gives you a few drinks and there's men throwing dollars at you and it's scary but all the time you're just looking at his face in the back of the room and he's like, you know, go ahead baby girl, go ahead, you're doing it for daddy and you're feeling proud because nobody's ever said that to you. And so then that night he tells you that there's more stuff that you've got to do and he takes you into a room and there's a man there and he tells you to strip and you think this is something you'll never do and yet there's a part of you that already knew how to do this because that's what your stepfather's been doing to you all these years before and so you turn that trick and it's like a part of you has died inside and so you come out of the club that night and you get in the car and you know he's pumping 50 cent and he takes you to McDonald's and he tells you did a good job tonight, sweetie. And he's stuffing his pockets with the thousand dollars that he made. And right now, you're happy. The people that I shouldn't have depend on, I was depending on for support. For support. You feel like this is the best that it's ever going to get and everything else in your life has prepared you for this moment. All the sexual abuse, all, all the neglect, all the drama, all the pain, all the trauma has prepared you for tonight where you stepped across a line that you always thought you'd never really quite step across. And you don't realize that night what it will be like to be on the track and get raped. And you don't realize that daddy isn't really going to protect you. You don't realize what it's like to have a gun held to your head that night. You don't realize what it's going to be like when you catch your first STD. You don't realize what it's going to be like when you first come home and daddy beats you for the first time because you didn't make enough money. You don't know what it's going to be like to have cops offer to trade sex with you in exchange for not being arrested. And then sometimes you'll do that and they'll still lock you up anyway. You don't know what it's like to sit up in jail and know that you just made 1500 for your pimp last night, but he won't come down and put $200 bail on just to get you out a few days early. You don't know what it's like to, to walk down the street at 6 o'clock in the morning when you're just getting off work and people are starting their day and they see you and they know what you do and they look at you in a way that you just don't feel like you belong in that world anymore. And you don't know what it's like to feel like you've lost part of yourself along the way and to feel like you'll never leave. And no matter how many times you try to leave, he'll always find you and catch you. But that night, all you care about is the fact you're riding in a Cadillac and you're eating McDonald's and you're listening to 50 and you got this one man who you really think loves you sitting right by your side. And so she started an organization for trafficked women. Ah, so I don't want you to... I don't want you to think that trafficking happens to people Good morning. you don't know. I recognize what people we're going to talk about this morning. Live in a, a different little neighborhood bit different than, than what you guys usually no, think about as you're doing your daily jobs and things like that. But, you know, Lizzie and Teresa, uh, both men.
moved into a huge suburban high school with a wealthy mom, dad, and brother. And she was lonely, a 15-year-old that went to school, big school, didn't know anybody. And some weeks later, the 16-year-old boy, down, a few lockers down, said, can I give you a ride home? He raped her, and then his friend's gang raped her, and she was too ashamed of what happened to her to tell her folks. They recognized that in her. And so she spent the next two years going to school every day, and when they called at night, she would crawl out her bedroom window and meet them for more sex because she was too ashamed of what happened to her to tell her folks. She did that for two years until the family moved away. Katerina and her mom moved into an apartment complex. Mom went to work. Katerina, chunky little 13-year-old, sat by the pool, utterly bored and lonely. Until this 19-year-old pretty girl came alongside of Katerina and befriended her. They went for coffee dates and they went for shopping and then the girl introduced her to a man who wanted to date Katerina. She went to school every day. 20 years later, she got out of trafficking. Who is at risk? Every woman, every man, with a cell phone or a computer, who hang out without adult supervision, who want to be liked, who want to fit in, who want to, don't want to be judged, who want to be loved and may do just about anything to maintain that love relationship. Or she might be your daughter who is in the bedroom on her cell phone or her computer at night. She may be using one of two billion apps. The common thread among those apps is they give you the ability to chat with and share pictures with strangers or your friends or your strangers that become your friends because he understands you so well and he's so much fun to talk to and he listens to you. Or he could be watching you through your camera. He could have hot, hot into your camera uh, and taken pictures of you with which he will use to, to um, uh, bribe you, back blackmail you. <clears throat> I say to kids, um, there are three things that determine, three, sexting, three texting shortcuts that describe this generation. And the first is FOMO, F-O-M-O, and you know what that means. Fear of missing out. That's not for kids, just adults, you know. I went to this conference. I want you to know where I am all the time. I don't want to miss anything, and I want you to know that I'm involved in everything. And secondly is NSFW. So you're typing with your girlfriend or boyfriend online and talking about things, and mom walks into the room, NSFW, not safe for work. You're in the office in the afternoon, you're watching pornography, and your boss comes in, NSFW. And the next one is GNOC. Get naked on camera. Why would you do that? Why are we doing Can you imagine at age four or five or six, thinking that you would ever expose your, your body on the camera naked. Now kids are doing it and adults are doing it. And we learned when we were little kids to say, no, I can't talk to strangers. But we haven't learned as 14-year-olds and 40-year-olds to say, no, I'm not interested in showing off my body. Just no. Anyway, men, men pretending they are boys are grooming women, especially online. And they are ripe for grooming uh, when they go through those apps. So the problem is when you get sucked into a relationship and can't get out of it, you get trafficked and you marinate in trauma. The trauma from trafficking is, they say, even worse than PTSD. It's called complex trauma. And it leads to confusion and hurt and um, trauma and suicide sometimes. That's, that's, um, that's a psychological problem. Socially, a girl who's been tra 
trafficked all her life, or a large part of it, has no social skills, has no life skills, has no ability to do anything. She is full of shame or resentment, and that shame makes, her hard, makes it hard for her to have a relationship with God. Where was he during all this? Can I trust him? You know, it's just a hopeless time. So psychological, social, and spiritual problems arise, obviously, if you've been trafficked for a long time, and then there are the physical things, the physical things that you can recognize, the physical things we want hospitals and first responders and policemen to recognize when they come on a scene that everything there is not always what it seems. Keep your eyes open because some of these things may indicate trafficking. She may have unexplained cuts and bruises, sexually transmitted infections, addictions, burn marks, bad teeth, poor hygiene, fractures, memory loss, and she'll die early. And she'll have tattoos. Now, a lot of our kids, a lot of you maybe have tattoos. But these tattoos represent ownership and money. And they're often on the neck, the arm, and the groin. They have a barcode, the property of, there's the, the pimp's name, you pay me. That's the problem, <laughs> in a nutshell. Uh, so what are we doing about it? What is stepping stones about it? And maybe this is something you want to get involved in. So the bottom one is community engagement, and that's what I'm doing today. And we do that at our church, or a church, my church, because they'll let me do it, uh, once, once a month. We have a third Monday that anybody in the community can come and just hear something you've heard today. How am I doing? Okay. 11.35. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll tell them, and we would like other churches to do that. You know, every third Thursday or every third something or other. You could, your church could be that. We also are in, uh, invested in prevention and protection. We have a sexting class for kids. We have um, more investment in other kids we'll tell you about. And then we will, we have restorative services where we restore women who have been trafficked. And we have a 12-month, 18-month recovery home for moms and their children. We take moms who've been trafficked and let them bring their children. We're one of two houses in the nation that allow that to happen. We don't want the children to stay with the trafficker or some other safe, uh, unsafe place. In addition to what we do with the women here, we have now taken the women who live in our house and taken them to healing outside of the house. So we can take her to uh, counseling here, or remedy here. And then we're inviting other troubled women to come to those classes as well, as well and explain, it extends our ability to help. In addition to that, we have our Conquer Groups, which is a pornography addiction group for men, eight to 10 week session. And then we have Journey Groups, which are for men, women, or men and women, if you've had some sexual abuse in the past and would just like to deal with it, uh, these groups are for you. Now, if this ever sparks an interest in what you'd like to do, I say anything you like to do, you can probably do for Stepping Stones. Uh, I, I'm on the education team. We need speakers. We need researchers. We need um, people to get themselves informed. Uh, you can work in operations, you can work direct services, you can work with the women, you can work in development, raising funds, you can work in events. We just had a, a festival of trees to raise money. We had that in Hawthorne Shopping Mall, even in the COVID, and we did okay. <laughs> and you could be a church champion or a business champion in your office or your church. You could be the go-to person that just keeps your church informed about what's happening in sex trafficking and keeps us informed with what's happening in your church. You know, I've raced through this. <laughs> Can I, uh, would you like to ask a question before I move along here? Yes? Uh, you might know more than I do. Uh, sex trafficking is, um, isn't always aborted. They may, she may be aborted, or they may bring, 
raise their kids because that's another hold he has on her to have that kid in the house as well. And that also is the new market for him, the next market. But those are also the things that if she does go for an abortion, the abortion provider should be aware of those physical signs as well as... Um, uh, so, these are things everybody can do. I don't want anybody to leave here without knowing 888-3737-888. That's the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So you're in a mall, you're at a bus station, you're at a corner, and I, you're saying, and you pick up 888-3737, and I, I see this thing that looks like trafficking. He is treating her bad, and she doesn't seem to want to go. And you tell him where you are, and that's all you have to do. The person on the other end will try and get a uh, policeman or a helper to fix it. Uh, the other thing on the right is the Traffic Cam app. You download Traffic Cam on your phone. Every time you walk into a motel or a hotel, you walk in, you take a picture of that wall, that wall, that wall, and that wall, upload it. I'm at room 473 of the Holiday Inn. And now they have the algorithms for that room in a database. So when another girl is advertising her body for sale online, they can match those two places. It's just an easy thing for you and me to do when we walk into a room. It's super easy. I actually have it on my phone and I've used it. You have to remember to use it, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. Yeah. And I, I like to use it right away because as soon as you get in there, you spread all your stuff around. No. Nah. Okay. All right. Uh, Stepping Stones has a 24-7 hotline, which is nice because when people need help, sometimes we can, they can't come to our house because they're not ready or they're not a mother. Uh, we will tr help her come alongside of her and trying to find a place for her. And I want to tell you, all right, kudos about the Lake County Sheriff Department. A lot of police departments are hard-hearted or unaware of trafficking. I mean, they know what it is, but they, don't, they, they, they think she wants to be in the business. And so they're not as alert. The Lake County Sheriff's Department is very alert, works very hard to take someone who is in a sting or an, a, 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 a raid or a prostitution, and their first desire is to lead her to help. It doesn't always work. In fact, in fact let me tell you that it's very hard to help a trafficked person. It's very, no, they're not sitting there waiting to be rescued. They, they can't trust you. What do you have that's going to be better than I've got? I can't trust you. So I, and I don't know how to handle you. So it's very hard to keep them. And keep them. So our vision at Stepping Stones and yours is that we will be an engaged, compassionate community where sexual exploitation is not tolerated, Human rights and dignity are valued, and the lives of both the victims and the perpetrators are being restored through God-centered relationships. I would like 11 more minutes to show you a video of, of people um, trapped in this relationship who got out through God-centered relationships. I see the first behavior in the first five seconds. I don't have to see another behavior one. for two or three or five or ten seconds. As an 11-year-old boy, I looked up to my dad and admired him. One day I was alone in our living room, and out of curiosity, I opened his briefcase. What I discovered began my journey as a prodigal son. In 1953, Playboy magazine was founded and the first edition was printed. And it was kind of a big deal to the culture. So big that Hugh Hefner, the publisher, didn't even know if there would be a second edition. But by 1965-66, when I was three or four years old, it had actually become a part of our American culture. I remember seeing it around on coffee tables growing up and a few of the trusted men in my neighborhood were using the bodies of the women on the page to supplement their sex lives. Most people think, you know, it's what guys do, no big deal. And I think those guys thought that too, until the day they made a choice. 
a choice I'm pretty certain they never thought they would ever make. As I looked through that Playboy magazine, I remember experiencing a surge of excitement while also feeling kind of yucky at the same time. Little did I know that porn would become a beast that dominated me and a cancer that gradually killed my soul. It caused me to view women as physical objects rather than human beings with a soul and spirit. Being addicted to porn was like having a noose of guilt and shame around my neck. The harder I tried to escape, the tighter the noose would get. Over time, I came to believe that things would never change. You see, these men, separately and unknown to one another, fell to the temptation to use a real body to ramp up their Playboy games. And that body was mine. And then it became a very big deal. And those men and I have lived with the cost of this for the rest of our lives. I grew up doing a lot of church things and learned a bunch of rules. I knew a lot about God in my mind, but I didn't know him in my heart. The same was true of my relationship with my dad. I spent many years wearing different masks while living in a spiritual and relational wasteland. I was a high achiever in school, sports, and the workplace. From the outside, it looked like I had a lot going for me, but I was very immature emotionally and spiritually. As my addiction evolved, things escalated. I discovered I needed more risk and adventure to get the same fix. In college, I got hooked on X-rated videos. In my early 20s, I began exploring strip clubs with other guys and lost my virginity with a woman I met while in the military. At that point, I remember the shame really kicking in as I thought to myself, well, now I've really blown it. God will never want anything to do with me. So I ran further away from him. While in grad school, I began seeking out escorts and prostitutes to satisfy my need for more adventure. Then came the new frontier of online dating and internet porn in my early 30s. I was completely out of control as my sexual brokenness reached even deeper levels of guilt and shame. The cost was high for me. Being exposed to that at a critical stage of my development and by trusted men no less, it really wreaked havoc with how I came to view myself, my value, my body, women, men, authority figures. It distorted my understanding of relationships, of sexuality, and of my purpose in this world. It really corrupted everything that matters. The cost was high for the men too, because I know that they have had to live with the deep shame of their no big deal fantasy escalating into a very big deal reality. Shame shrouds our light and makes us hide in relationships and from feeling worthy to step into all of who we could be in the world. I suspect it corrupted what really matters for them too. I would dare to say that they have some regrets. I have regrets too. I lived much of my life unconsciously and with a deep sense of shame, like a feeling that I was just bad. You see, one of the men had told me that I was to blame for this and that I had made him do it. Well, lies like that implanted in a soul at such a young age left me scrambling to display an image of perfection on the outside to cover all that up while trying to navigate life with a corrupted belief system. And I ended up in a painful relationship cycle. I would try, I would fail, recover. Try, fail, recover. Only I never really recovered. I just poured my pain into becoming a successful workaholic and a social alcoholic. And I made many choices that I never thought I would make. I knew Jesus loved me from my childhood, but each failure, each bad choice, made me run further away from him and from home. One night, I was walking in a park. I sat down on a bench and began crying for several minutes. I looked up at the stars in the sky and said, Jesus, I believe you exist, but it feels like you're a million miles away. If you're real, I need you to come and help me because I can't help myself. A few days later, I got up the courage to talk to my pastor about my struggles. I didn't know how he would react, but feared he would shame me. Fortunately, he didn't, and referred me to a local men's purity small group. During the first meeting I attended, I heard a voice in my head whisper, I'm going to use you to help others with this problem. God used that group to begin revealing his grace in many ways, including helping me begin reconciling my relationship with my dad. One night, I was in a bar that my friends and I used to go to a lot, 
and I went to the bathroom by myself. It was like a onesie bathroom. I could still picture it. And I was washing my hands, staring at myself in the mirror. And as I looked at myself, I had this surreal moment where I did not recognize myself. And this revelation flooded my mind. I'm not living the life I was created to live. And then I heard this voice almost simultaneously say, I want you to come home. I knew it was God. And I said, okay, okay. I have never regretted that moment and that choice. I turned my life toward God and let Jesus and the Holy Spirit in. And I fell in love with the Word of God and with the one who had saved me in that bathroom, in that bar that night. And I pursued him with all that I had. And then step by step, he started undoing all the damage that had been done by my past, my childhood, and by the choices that I had made. The night before my baptism, I felt very anxious and worried about what people would think of me after hearing my testimony. Then the Holy Spirit reminded me of the following scripture. This is my son, whom I love and am well pleased. Tears began streaming down my face as I realized my father had never told me that he loved me or that he was proud of me. Hearing those words from my Heavenly Father gave me peace and courage because I knew for sure that he loved me and was not ashamed of me. Several years later, in his perfect timing, God began to orchestrate the details of my healing from the sexual violations. He had strategically placed a couple, a man and a wife, in my life, and they just kept showing up over and over and over again, and they started to feel like safe people to me. Well, God had told me at one point that I would have a healing ministry, but I didn't even know what that meant. It was early on in my faith walk. I didn't really know what did that mean. And I thought that this couple might be able to help me understand. So I arranged a meeting with them. Well, neither the couple nor I had any idea that God had more planned for us than conversation. But that meeting turned into a prayer experience and that prayer experience radically changed my life. During the prayer time, the Holy Spirit showed me through a vivid picture the details of one of the Playboy magazine moments. It was incredibly painful and hard to watch. I know my God. And as most survivors of abuse ask, where is God in this? That's how I was feeling. Where were you? Why didn't you protect me? I was asking and I was crying this question out. And then I received a new view of the room and I saw Jesus. He was standing in the corner and he was watching the scene and tears were just streaming down his face. And in that moment, I saw and I understood the deep compassion of God. I saw that he was with me then, and that he's with me now, and he is with me through every painful trial during my time on this earth. And in that moment, then Jesus came, and he physically lifted me up out of the situation, and he started to walk out of the room. He was carrying me. And he stopped, and he looked down at me, and he asked me, do you want to go with me or do you want to stay here? And I had a decision to make. It was clear to me that this was a decision point he was giving me. Would I let Jesus take me, restore my life and become a survivor, or would I remain a victim of my circumstances? You know, you'd think that it would be an easy choice, but it wasn't. I said yes, but I gotta tell you, it took all the faith and the courage that I had and interestingly enough, what I came for ended up being true that day was the beginning of my healing ministry. Many years later, when I was first getting involved in the issue of sex trafficking, I was sitting in a Target having a tea with a friend and it was like an interruption to the conversation, smack in the middle of talking, that same scene was placed before my eyes. It was like a movie screen drop from heaven. And again, the focus was on Jesus in that same corner, gazing at the scene of what was happening, tears streaming down his face. This time, I saw a fuller truth. Jesus wasn't just weeping for me. He was weeping for the man, too. In the entire scene, when Jesus acted, he did not show any anger toward the man. He didn't yell at him. He didn't go over and wail on him. He showed no condemnation. He only showed compassion. He just wept. And I too hold no malice or unforgiveness. I just weep. And I deeply desire for all involved the same gift that I've received, 
peace, freedom, restoration, new life, Jesus. Jesus or not. It does seem strange, but that's the problem. It's very hard for a traffic person to receive help. And so we sometimes have them and they don't make it, um, which is an attitude we can under, try and understand for other people who we don't understand why they don't change their behavior. Any comments or questions? Got a mic. We've got a mic, so you can just raise your hand. This will probably turn on sometime. So, any questions? Actually, they are part of the task force that our presentation is going to be from on the 27th. So on Wednesday, January 27th, we do have that Zoom presentation. It's The task force is a variety of different organizations in Lake County. Stepping Stones is a part of that task force. Uh, where I used to work, Zachariah Sexual Abuse Center is part of that task force. The Sheriff's Department, they've got a lot of different people that are helping address and help kind of restore people from this. So I think that presentation is also going to be something that's really helpful. We have that movie night on the 23rd. So there's a couple different things that we still have to just really help us as we learn more about this to, to kind of act on it and see what we can do and just kind of help educate people. So I wanted to highlight those things. Um, and then I'm going to, if you guys, unless Josh, if you want to, but I figured if we can pray um, and just write, like this is a lot for us to know about, but we know that we have an amazing God that restores people who've been rescued from this, that heals that brokenness. And so just to pray for a moment of just the people in our county, but also just around the world that are experiencing this. So I'm going to do that. Um, and then I have one unrelated announcement that I forgot to do at the beginning. So dear God, I just thank you so much that you allowed Jean to come out today and just gave us all the opportunity to hear this. I thank you that you are working in these situations, um, that you can heal, that you can restore. And God, we know that your heart breaks when people experience the evil that this is. We know that you are there with them, that you are present in that, and that is hard to understand. Continuing to work and rescuing people and just helping us all know what we can do to, to have a part in that, whether it is just learning more or God, whatever it is, I just pray that you really would be working in our hearts um, and just working around this world to help the people that are helping others out of this and just God to just be present with those who are facing the evil. In Jesus' name, amen.
Um, and then my last unrelated announcement is that the church uh, database is having a really hard time with emails. So some of you have gotten emails from the church database this week. Some of you have not. So just know that you might be missing some of this stuff. Like it came up in conversation with my mom yesterday. She's like, oh, I got the email about the sermon notes. And I was like, oh, I never got that. So another announcement that some of the ladies may have missed is that on January 24th, we have a baby shower for Melissa and Austin Nee for their little baby. So we would love, right, to celebrate them, this new life that's coming. Uh, so ladies, if you would like to come to the shower, please RSVP to Laura. Uh, if you would like to give to a group gift, please give your money to Maria. Uh, but yeah, that came out in an email that only some people got and we don't know who got it. So if you didn't get it and you need more information, either approach me, Laura, or Maria, and we can help you get that information. But it is going to be on Sunday, January 24th in the community room after the service and after community group time. So probably around noon. Melissa is going to be zoomed in, right? COVID, different concerns and things. So also, if anyone doesn't feel comfortable being there in person and would like to zoom in, let us know too. But just so you know, she will be zoomed in as well. So that is all I've got.